The following interview was, was conducted with Gordon L. Coppock, Assistant Dean and Director of the Medical Education Program at Purdue University School of Veterinary Medicine. The, uh, the, program, the interview was for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, April 3rd. 2009 in Stewart 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome, Dr. Kavik, and good afternoon to you. And let us start with tell us where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. <clears throat> well, I was born in Larned, Kansas, and I have um, two brothers and one sister. The sister that's living is adopted. Uh, there was a sister that was born, I'm number three in the family, and uh, my, the oldest one is my brother Louis, and then there was a sister by the name of Elizabeth Jeanette, and she died a crib death during her first year, and then they had me, and I was supposed to be a girl, so that was the first disappointment. <laughs> and then they tried again, and they had my younger brother Jim, and they decided that they better just give up, and they later adopted a girl that's uh, my sister Gail, and she fits right into the family. And it's just How old was she when she was adopted? Uh, she was actually about six or seven because oh. she came from a dysfunctional family <coughs> of alcoholics, and uh, she needed help. So that's good. Okay. Where was She's school? A early of our family. Uh, early school, and then tell us about so, high school. Uh, the town I grew up in was called Belpre, B-E-L-P-R-E, -E, Kansas, a town of about 320 when I was there. It's about 200 now. Uh, the high school and grade school, when my mother was there, there were 30 in a class. I started the school with about 12 kids, graduated with six of them, and that was all that was in our class. Three boys and three girls went this through grade, the entire grade school? grade school through high school. We started in the first grade. I started and it went school, same school at five. all the way through. All of all the way through. Interesting. Small. Not likely to happen. <coughs> oh no. Oh. So that was uh, Belfry High School graduated. And Any student uh, activities that you participate in? Or? Oh yes, in a small school like that, you do everything. <laughs> Including so ring the bell. To, <laughs> I belonged. I belonged to 4-H, and so we had what we called a, a square dance medley uh, that competed around the state. We had nice costumes. And the reason we called it the medley is the four of the guys also ran the medley relay on the track team. And so we would have to go from one event to another. I sang, I played trumpet, met my wife taking trumpet lessons from her father when I was in the seventh grade and she was in the sixth. My goodness, how wonderful. So I did solos at state, did track. I still hold two track records, high and low hurdles. Never be broken because the league doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> you took the record with you. <laughs> but um, the total enrollment in the league probably doesn't equal Lafayette Jeff. <laughs> so it's, it's okay. pretty rural. You're a star in your own pretty right. Pretty rural. I'm a yeah. star in my own right. Okay. And I got to go to the state meet and some other things, so it was good. Sure. Okay. But I was a bookworm. And I used to read voraciously. And I loved reading. And so I did sports because in my family that was the thing to do. I did music because I liked music all right, but my mother thought I should be able to play the piano so I could play at church. And of course, you have to do an instrument if you're in a small town. So, And I used to play taps from it was about the sixth grade on at the uh, Memorial Day observances. First in the Protestant cemetery, and then in the Catholic cemetery, right across the road from each other. <coughs> so. That's nice. Horn was, uh, trumpet was, music was a big deal in my sure. life, but mostly I like to read. Okay. Then after high school, what came next? Well, I was going to be a veterinarian from the time of about the fifth grade on. How did you happen to get those thoughts? Where, well, you know, I, like the I was a cowboy. Animals. I was a cowboy. And I used to ride my uncle's horse all the time. And we had a veterinarian come down and, and clean a cow. I don't know if you know what that means, but anyway, help with the afterward. And we paid him 15 bucks. And I thought, wow, you can do something interesting and get paid for it. So I was going to be a veterinarian from then on. And senior year, before I went to Kansas State, people would say, well, why don't you be a real doctor? 
you're going to go to all that school be a real doctor. So I enrolled in Kansas State and pre-med and went to the clinic club meetings and all they could talk about was psychosomatic illness. And I thought, I don't want to mess around with people that think they're sick. I want to deal with things that are really sick. And need help. <laughs> so I went back to veterinary medicine and got uh, into vet school after two years, which was not that unusual then. Okay. And uh, sometime during the first semester of veterinary school, I fell in love with biochemistry and thought about dropping out of vet school and just going into biochemistry. And I thought, no, there are probably a lot of biochemists, but there are not a lot of biochemists that have a full understanding of the animal. And so then I decided to stay in vet school. Um, I continued to date that girl that I met when I was in the seventh grade. She went to KU. She wouldn't go to K-State. She's a music major. And so I went, uh, made a lot of trips to Lawrence, Kansas. We got married after she graduated. She wouldn't marry me before. And uh, so I lived then in Onega, Kansas, and drove the last year of my vet school 50 miles one way <laughs> to class. And then I went to Harvard, graduated and went to Harvard. What, you, to, what, what, what sort of program were you going to take there? Uh, graduate school, PhD program. Okay. Uh, when I was a senior in vet school, the, a guy came from the Army and said, one way or the other, you guys are all going to be in the military. This was, as you know, in the Vietnam War. Was it? Okay. I was born in 1939, so I was right at that age and mm -hmm. had the student deferment. But I was 1A otherwise. And so he said, here are your options. And I said, well, I don't like that option. I don't like. But the option that I liked was the Berry Plan, where you enlist. So I enlisted in the Air Force in the Berry Plan, and that meant that I went to graduate school at Harvard on my own money uh, and got my PhD and then went to the Air Force. So what what do you, uh, school, and what did you get your PhD in? I got a PhD in pharmacology. Uh, Dr. Paul Munson was my PhD advisor, and uh, Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So then he moved to North Carolina before I finished my degree, and so I could start over and move to North Carolina with him. So I spent a year at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in the School of Medicine, and that's where I did my first teaching. Still working on my PhD, which came from Harvard in '68, and. Uh, that's where our first daughter was born, in, Laura, in Chapel Hill. She's a Tar Heel. Okay. And uh, somewhere around June or so, I got a letter from the Army or, or for the Air Force and said, it's time for you to show up. So I said, all right, <laughs> I'll do that. And in October, I went to the School of Aerospace Medicine, uh, Brooks Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas, and did research and taught. Could your family go with you? Oh, sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, the whole family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, well, and that brings up another point. Uh, I I can't remember whether I was a first or second lieutenant when I enrolled, when I enlisted, but it was one or the other. But by the time I got there, I had enough time that they made me a captain. So Moved up rather good. quickly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people can say that. But I have to tell you that. My next door neighbor, who was real Air Force, said, Kopik, I hope you never have the nerve to tell anyone you were in the military. And so I said, all right, Hugh. His name was Hugh Ellington. I said, all right, Hugh, I will, any time it comes up, I will tell people that you said. And the reason was that, uh, well, it's not quite like MASH, but we did have different circumstances. Okay. <laughs> Research, things, you know, I didn't have to go do all the things. Sure, I understand. That they did. And I'd had two years of ROTC at Kansas State, so they didn't even make me do the basic training. Was that the times when it was required? Oh, it was absolutely required. Like I didn't have a choice. Purdue. Yeah, it was Purdue. I didn't have a choice. We My had, brother had that at Georgetown, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had two years of physical education you had to do, hmm. and two years of ROTC, no choice. Wow. You had to do. That, that goes your place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's before the late 60s. <laughs> They could still require them. Right. Yeah. So anyway, then it, from Harvard, uh, Harvard was a wonderful experience. An absolutely. You like living in Cambridge? Did you live in Cambridge or? No, we lived in in Boston, Brookline, Massachusetts first, 
and then after one year moved to Boston because my graduate work was in the medical school area, and so that made more sense. Sure. Right. And uh, don't need too many details of those years. But anyway, they were wonderful. Gave my first university lecture in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Was scheduled to give it. There was a snowstorm that night, and it snowed two inches. And I called up and said, are you going to have classes? Because I was terrified of giving that lecture. And they said yes. <laughs> so I decided, well, I have to go through with this. And I lived through it. And so I'm the surprised students, normally there's a, even a mention of snow. <laughs> well, it, down there, when it snows, they turn all the stoplights off, blinking red or something like that. And it's pandemonium, so it really was bad. But they had yeah, classes, right. and I had to give my lecture. <laughs> so. I was doing research there in the Memorial Hospital, uh, which is where the medical school was located. And I was there at the lab one night at 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, and my wife called and said, you better come home, it's time for me. Uh, my water broke. And so I drove home, picked her up, took her back to the hospital, which was right around the corner from where my lab was. And I would sit with her and then I'd run around and see how my monkeys were doing, because I had just done experiments and wanted them to survive so I could get my PhD finished and then back around to see her. So it was quite an experience. I would say so. <laughs> then it worked out. Yeah, it worked out. So anyway, they went to San Antonio to Texas and uh, it's the only time in my life I've ever had an eight to five job in the military. It was, uh, that was a good experience and we did a lot of uh, canoeing in West Texas, hiking. It was a, it was a nice time. And then I decided that I needed more training in biochemistry, so I, I decided to get a postdoc and wrote to a fellow by the name of Guy Williams Ashman, who was then at Johns Hopkins University. And while we were corresponding, he moved back to the University of Chicago. So I ended up living in Chicago at a place where I swore I'd never, ever live. But we love Chicago. We are real Chicago chauvinists now. Um, we love Chicago, and the University of Chicago was a great place. And I did two years of postdoc work with Dr. Williams Ashman, and then got hired by Purdue University. How did that come about? Did in they, August of 1971. How did that come about? Did they? Did, was there an opening, or did they? Well, I wrote to vet schools around the country. I decided I wanted to still use my veterinary part of my identity, even though I've been at the medical schools. And. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gerald Getch and Bill Carlton came up to one of the CRWAV meetings, uh, it was an animal research workers meeting, and met with me. And from then, it worked out that I ended up coming to Purdue University in August of 71. Got to mention that while we were in Chicago, uh, our daughter Elizabeth, known as Beth, was born. In so South Chicago, no, just two daughters. Two. Just two. One in Chapel Hill and oh, okay. one in Chicago. And uh, so I had two daughters and two cats and one wonderful wife when we <laughs> moved to Lafayette. Uh, Where did <laughs> you live when you first came here? We lived in one of Stewart's homes out on Lindbergh Road. Okay. Uh, Bill Carlton lived right next to us and he found a place for us. Okay. That was a nice home. Uh, but we decided it had every disadvantage of country and not a single advantage because there were no sidewalks, there was no place where you could really go walking, you had to drive everywhere. So we then moved into two blocks from the university campus over on Vine Street and lived there until night, the year 2000 when we uh, decided to build a one floor capable living house out on, uh, still in town, out on uh, Hartman Court. How much? Hartman Court. It's just off of Soldier's Home Road. And so we've lived there now eight years, eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. your children come, where are your children now? Are they at college? Or um, Laura, the older daughter, they're both musicians and scientists of sorts. Laura's a, a chemistry major from DePaul University by Beta Kappa and went there on a scholarship playing violin and then went to the University of Wisconsin she got a master's degree in biochemistry and decided she'd rather do music. And so she's um, 
living, she's married now, and lives in Indianapolis and has four kids, three boys and one girl, the only granddaughter we have. And she is just now going back to school to learn to teach mathematics to middle school people. I think it's middle school. Anyway, she's very courageous, very bright girl. She's semi-pro violinist, plays music in orchestras and in small groups around the area, so she's good. Her husband works for uh, a little company. <laughs> he's, a, he's an engineer. Purdue engineer. Both of our daughters married Purdue engineers. Um, Beth is in Madison, Wisconsin. That's your youngest now. That's the youngest. Okay. She has three boys, ages five down to uh, about seven months. She's actually coming this weekend to see us. Um, her husband uh, is Matt Gunshore, son of Robert Gunshore, who was on the Purdue faculty for many years. They dated some in high school, but then parted, and he went off, and she went off, and then the first thing you know, they were back together and got married, and so they've now got those three kids. And he works at the university. And she's raising children and teaching private uh, lessons all over the place, and choirs and things, up in Madison for a church and for uh, kinder music or something like that. I never get the right name. You're mentioning music. I know you have an interest, but your wife is there and can play some quite a bit. Both of you are very active uh, in the community. Yes, my wife is a musician. That's why she went to KU. She was first chair flute from her first year flute. on uh, for four years. And uh, she played in the Lafayette Symphony from about 1972 or three until about three or four years ago when she retired. Playing flutes in an athletic event and at the level she plays and wants to play. I think she still sounds pretty darn good. <laughs> but she's not, she's not too impressed with how she plays. But anyway, so she's giving private lessons and oh, created the flute choir here in town and has won several awards. Good. Good. So it's a musical family. I and know. I play in the vintage brass. Ooh, okay. I play E flat alto. When they first formed the group, she wanted me to play E flat alto and I said I can't. She said, well, the good people don't want to play your part. <laughs> That's an interesting song. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, back to Purdue. Uh, the physiology and pharmacology. That's when your department, of course, it, the name was changed after a while. To, and then to basic medical sciences. Let's talk a little bit about your involvement and then move on to the Okay, I was an assistant professor when I came. And um, by miracle of miracles, got an NIH grant and did some other things. Um, first thing I knew, they had made me a professor after an associate and then professor. And then uh, Dr. Getch retired, and so they had a series of people in to be potential department heads, and I looked and I said, I don't want to work for that guy, I don't want to work for that guy. So I threw my hat in the ring, and the first thing I knew, I was a department head in 1979, eight years after I arrived. Too young, actually, but that's the way it happened. And, uh, I taught pharmacology to veterinary students, heavily involved in teaching all those years and did some weird experiments with teaching. Um, the medical school expanded, the medical school started in 1971, formally the legislature created this branch and the other branches. And that was first year only. In 1980 they started the second year of the medical school. And so uh, Roger Michael who was from the School of Pharmacy, right. and I created the pharmacology course. And so I taught in the pharmacology course, and still teach in the pharmacology course, um, until... Who was the head? Was that when Dr. Wagner, was Dr. Wagner the first head of the Dr. Wagner created the center okay. and retired in 1997. Uh, and about that time, um, I became interim head for a variety of reasons. And then they made me actually assistant dean and director of the medical program in 1998. And I've been that ever since. Uh, when they wanted me to become director, I said, well, that's fine, but I'm not leaving Purdue. And so I have 100% appointment still at Purdue, but IU pays half my salary <laughs> to, for that. And I'm an assistant dean and a voting faculty member in the medical school. I don't know how they ever did that, but 
So your assistant deanship is with the medical school. The assistant deanship the is with Indiana not University the School of Medicine. Okay. Yes. And uh, I was department head up until December 31, 2008. And then you decided to step down? And both. Uh, well, I decided to step down way earlier, oh. but the replacements weren't identified. Do they have somebody that's heading that? Yes, Lori, Dr. Lori Yeager is a Purdue graduate and has spent some time at Texas A&M and came back. And I'm quite pleased to have Lori So he's back, you know, just on that she program? Is a she is. Oh, just she, okay. She's just on a full-time, just on that program? Oh, she's the full-time faculty member in the School of Medicine. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then teaches that. And she's an anatomist. Yeah. The faculty there, has that changed over time in the medical now aren't they calling it this Indiana University School of well, Medicine we have, Lafayette? I, my identity is really confusing. Let so let's talk first book. about the vet school. Okay, okay. The but the name, the name is, is, am I correct in that? Well, when I came, we uh, were the... Uh, Lafayette Center for Medical school. Education, wasn't it? I'm talking about the, uh, the medical school okay. there. Okay, all right. Let's, yeah. We'll talk about medical school, but then all I want right. to be sure vet school, because right. that's really where I was. Go ahead, right? yeah. Um, medical school was initially called uh, the Lafayette Center for Medical Education. And then about two or three years ago, the legislature changed it to the Indiana University School of Medicine Lafayette on the campus of Purdue University. So we got the Purdue in there. So that's its official name now. It's one of eight regional campuses um, located at various universities throughout the state. Uh, we have, at this time, 16 students per class, but we're scheduled to increase to 24 students per class. We have very, well, I shouldn't say poor, but they are less than optimal facilities. We are the only <laughs> center in the state that has less than optimal facilities. But Purdue is really now working hard to help us get better facilities in the medical school, so we're hopeful that even though the economy is horrible at this point, that we'll get a new building approved this legislative session. And then we can uh, do more. At this time also, we're planning on expanding the School of Medicine to include third and fourth years in the regional centers. But it won't be, Purdue won't have a medical school in the sense that people think of it, but we'll have students rotating through like, the like third and fourth now. years. Okay. Yeah used to be that they all went back to Indianapolis and did all of their clinical rotations there except family medicine. And now they will do rotations at each of the centers throughout the state. We'll have rotation possibilities. So that all depends on what the legislature does with our budget ask this year. Because we need money to do the expansion. We want to increase by 84 students. And uh, we're hopeful that, that they can find the money to do it. Uh, what, how do the students come here? Do they uh, are they selected by the med the, the, the uh, students all apply to Indiana University School of Medicine. They're admitted to Indiana University. They are given an option of which center they want to go to. Ninety five or more percent of them say they want to go to Indianapolis. <coughs> so that means that about forty seven percent of them are not happy with where they end up because half the class goes to a regional center. And within about two weeks after they arrive at the regional centers, they decide that that was really for the better. They love it and they adapt quickly because it's a small environment, they get a lot of attention, which is good if you want attention. If you want to hide, it's a lousy place to be because you can't hide in all kinds of it. Uh, so, half of them, but all of the expansion is going to occur at the center. So we will have almost two-thirds of the medical students in the first two years at the regional centers. And we keep reminding the IU School of Medicine Administration of that fact that, that they need to treat us right. Give us <laughs> Down the road there. <laughs> Down the road. We, we push them. Yeah. But I need to go back to the vet school because yeah. the vet Please school do has changed dramatically when I first came. It was the School was of Ordinary Science and Medicine. Yeah. Doc Stockton, uh, was he the dean? Jack Stockton and I came the same year. That was one of his first acts, and so did President Hanson. So it was Everyone, a time of right. big change in the university. I have now served under, in the vet school, Jack Stockton, uh, Hugh Lewis, uh, Al Rebar, Willie Reed, 
Did I forget anybody? Nope. I think no? we got it all. Because the first one, all? the first one was Erskine Morris. Yeah. All right. And then in the medical school, I served under uh, Holden, Bob Holden, and Brader, Craig Brader. So I've trained a lot of deans. <laughs> yeah, I've been trained. That's great. Oh. Yeah. Do you fun. um just when you were with the, with the medical center? Do you attend meetings for the faculty down there in Indianapolis? Or oh yes. We do? uh, well, one of the changes. Dean, the assistant that, dean. Yeah. I, I attend a lot of meetings at the School of Medicine, and at least one a month when the directors get together, and then we have the executive committee of the School of Medicine meets the same days, and so I go to those, and I serve on some of the school committees, uh, scholarship committee for a while, uh, a 3D steering committee, which is an interesting thing. The dean Brader decided that he couldn't continue to run the school the way it had been, but there were too many promises made in the past that he couldn't figure out how legitimate they were and the maldistribution of resources. So he decided he was going to do data-driven decision-making. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> 3D. Put, I will put that 3D, data-driven decision-making. And uh, what that means is that you figure out how many brownie points you get for so many hours of teaching, how much you get for each grant you get, and how the clinicians achieve uh, reward, or what I call brownie points. That's kind of a denigrating term, but still it's production credits. Let's use something like that. And then the budget is, uh, got the school budget, and you see how many brownie points are by this department, how many that one, and how many by that one, and that's how the money is distributed. So I serve on that steering committee, even though I don't like the way it's affected our regional centers, but we've reminded them that, and we have some political power, so they've made some changes. That's good. <laughs> Got a little consensus there. A little, right? little change. <laughs> and then I also served on the uh, steering committee of the accreditation committee. We just underwent accreditation the from year. the, you no, at here. the medical school. Oh, the medical school. Oh, they have gone through three of those with the vet school, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to do it anymore because I'm not ahead anymore. But uh, in the medical school, I still get to do those things. And uh, we just completed our accreditation, and we think we will be fully accredited, uh, especially if Purdue comes through with a building for our program. Um, so I've served on a lot of committees there yeah. and make a lot of trips to Indianapolis. We do polycom a lot, so we're starting to do some video conferencing. You have that uh, one of the that um, Basic Medical Science Interactive Multimedia Research Center. I, I, can't, I came up with that. Uh, oh, that, that, is that, that still was uh, Dr. Um, Jim Walker's Walker, right, creation. Yeah, right. And I did that. Something that I read in doing the research yeah. came up with it. Is that yeah. still being used? or? Oh, uh, we still use some of the things that were created with that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I've always pushed technology. Vet school was, uh, I was the first to get outside of engineering to get the internet into a school and have pushed hard on technology. In fact, the dean called me a certified technology guru or something like that. <laughs> Retirement. That's all right. That's yeah, okay. and so it's still fun. And we're working on some projects now to create 3D stereo uh, images of anatomy. Very good. Human and animal cadavers. Yeah. So we're working on all this stuff. It's fun. Back to the vet school, let's talk a little bit more about that. Why, it used to be vet physiology and pharmacology, and then it became what, basic medical sciences? Well, I the vet school was School, school like of Veterinary Science and Medicine, and then yeah. Dean Stockton got the name changed to the School of Veterinary right. Medicine. Okay. Uh, I went into veterinary physiology and pharmacology. Mm -hmm. When and you came here? When I came here. And then in 1995, I think it is, or four, we decided to merge the departments of veterinary anatomy and veterinary pharmacology and physiology, physiology and pharmacology. And uh, had several interactions with the president and Bob Ringel about names. And finally, we managed to get them to accept the Department of Basic Medical Sciences. <laughs> so I was the first head of the Department of Veterinary Physiology and Pharm of uh, Basic Medical Sciences and then was head of that until, from 95 until 2009. 
eight. What sort of December. changes did you bring about and, and did you increase the faculty and how about research? You could tell us about your research too. Well, my research when I first came here was based on cancer research mm -hmm. done at the Ben May Laboratory in the University of Chicago and uh, managed to work with, um, oh my goodness, what's his name? You can put it in when you get the transcript. <laughs> that's okay. I know I have blanks like that. Yes. Senior citizens, whatever. That's what we call it. Give yeah. me 10 minutes. Um, Heinz Floss, who was head of medicinal chemistry. Ed, and mm -hmm. I started in the School of Pharmacy, right. which no longer exists either. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the School of Pharmacy exists, but that department has been merged. And um, he and I started the cancer discussion group. He had the power and the prestige, and I did the grunt work because I was an assistant professor. And we organized several um, meetings of cancer researchers on the campus. And then after about a year or two, um, Jim Moray came and said, hey guys, we should start a specialized cancer center. And we said, oh, you can't get a specialized cancer center. We don't have a medical school. And Jim said, well, the University of California, Irvine's got one. We can get one. And one thing led to another, and we got a cancer center. And I, uh, although I wasn't one of the three powerful out. professors <laughs> that helped to really make it happen, I did an awful lot of the work, and as a department, I uh, helped make it successful, I think. Uh, when I first became head of my department, and it was the same Heinz Floss <laughs> told me I wouldn't be able to hire anybody. And I said, what do you mean? Because I was so naive. He said, well, nobody really good will want to come to your department because you don't have any research going. And I said, well, what do I have to do? So I asked lots of people and talked, and that's when I decided that I would sell a university not a department or a school, I would sell a university. And by making that change and working primarily through the cancer center initially, uh, I made all of uh, our search committees have to have people from School of Pharmacy or from Biology or someplace on. Every graduate committee had to have somebody from one of those other units on it, so I really integrated my department into the university. And we had strong relationships with biomedical engineering and had uh, five uh, PhDs, MD PhDs, come through our department in basic medical sciences, VPH, basic medical sciences. Um, they've done really well, those guys. People like Dr. Tacker, Dr. Babs, and mm -hmm. Borland, and others, Les Geddes. Uh, mm -hmm. And we worked very closely together. So had a lot of impact that way. Uh, brought Paul Robinson in, uh, brought other researchers, Tom Chan, Tom Dasani, and people who were good at research, to do cytometry laboratories. And you've probably seen Robinson's all over the press yeah, these I hope days. He's he's, I hope he's successful. Well, I hope even if he's not successful, he comes back. <laughs> That's what I meant, comes back. That, I don't care whether he makes it to the top of the Mount that's my Mount feeling. Everest or not, exactly. but I want him to come back. That's right, exactly. I want him to come back. That's a gutsy thing. Oh, oh well, Paul's gutsy. If there's, if there's anyone that's gutsy, it's Paul. He's, <laughs> but he's good. So we got some really great research people mm -hmm. that have come into the department. And I managed to change the culture. It was a good culture. It was a great bunch of people I worked with. Yeah. Dr. Gedge, Schneer, Carter, Jackson, all the wonderful people, but we didn't have much research. You're doing more of an interdisciplinary thing. So, so we do a lot of interdisciplinary. Before We've been it was strong. really? Yes. We were doing interdisciplinary work before it was the style. That's right, exactly. And that's because I said we can't be successful as a little tiny department. One of the things that was good about merging with the Department of Anatomy is it gave us a little more of a critical mass. And then we inherited the uh, Center for Paralysis Research and the Neurologic Research and Dr. Van Sickles, a bone and Joint Articulation Laboratory. Right. So it gave us more critical mass. Right. And, and brought more yeah. focus into Brought things, more, right? well, not more focus because it's well, hard to define who we are, but it gave us more 
more mass in the three areas, neurology, um, cancer, and uh, biomedical engineering. Um, we've had a strong relationship with them and, ha and I've managed to get uh, several people duly appointed so that we've had a lot of interactions with Dr. Wadika and biomedical engineering. Um, and that all continues. Um, I also pushed educational research. I helped to found uh, an organization called Convince, which was a national organization of veterinarians uh, trying to push applications of computers to education. We got some funding from IBM. And Charlie Branch at the Auburn University and I decided that nobody was going to do educational research aimed at veterinary medical education, so we would do it. So he and I each managed he, because he convinced his department head, I, because I was the department head, <laughs> uh, took on a graduate student, and mine was named Pete Bill. Pete uh, got his PhD from me. I made him be first a pharmacologist, but he also took lots of courses from the School of Educa from Education and uh, got here his PhD here, here on here. campus. And uh, he has been incredibly successful. He is director of the veterinary technology program and has successfully created a distance education program for veterinary technicians, which is kind of ironic, you know, because it's a skill-based profession. You say, how can you have a distance program that's a nationally accredited that's skill-based? And he figured out ways to accomplish that, working with veterinarians and videos and all other sorts of, of things, so it's been very successful. And because of my interest in technology, uh, we were the ones who really pushed hard uh, early on because all the courses that were required for the first phase were in my department. And so we were very supportive. For the vet tech program? For the vet tech program. Yeah, yeah so that's worked well. And Dr. Bill and has done well. And I've got one graduate student that's right. in the National Academy of Medicine. He's now a distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina yeah. and um, uh, in the National Academy of Medicine, Jim Riviera. The vet tech program is, is unique because it's affiliated with the vet school. Uh, uh, pretty close to unique. Michigan right. State has one too okay. that's associated with the vet school, but uh, we are, without a doubt, the premier veterinary technology program in the nation, if not the world. <laughs> it's pretty well. Up yeah, it's everybody agrees on that. Yeah. I'm not just tooting my own. <laughs> and Dr. Bill is doing a wonderful job that's with that good. program. What's your, uh, you're still just in the department now? Are you, are you still the head? No, I stepped down as head. Okay. The, uh, so 09 is a different December, year. December 09 is a different year. Now I am still a dean, assistant dean and director of the medical program. And we'll probably do that for a couple of years unless the world comes to an end. Sure. Okay. I'm 69 and as my granddaughter would say, five twelfths. <laughs> that sounds like Sherm Kessler, you know, who used to be on the board of trustees, yep. passed away. I had lunch with him one time, and his birthday's in December. This was in December. He said, well, this is the mm, 20th day of my 92nd year. <laughs> 20th day of my, yeah, well, I've got it, but the granddaughter gives her age always in years, so I'm, I'm uh, four and seven twelfths, four and eight twelfths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked a little bit about the deans. Then you have your, the, the diversity. And uh, make any comments on that? Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, we hired women um, and had women in the department. Um, I, I like the joke. We had an Australian. We even had an Oklahoman in our department. But the real diversity came when Dr. Elias Sam joined the department. And uh, that was a tremendous addition. He's a good scientist and does a nice job of educating and managed to get him into the associate deanship of the School of Veterinary Medicine, where he did an excellent job. And then he was interim dean. It was, oh, that's the other dean I served under, an interim dean. <laughs> um, so he was interim dean before Dr. Reed came. Uh, he's done very well. He's now stepped back to of being a professor and is currently uh, nearing the end of a sabbatical leave mm. where he's trying to learn science again. <laughs> because after all those years of administration, you know, you tend to forget. That's right. And 
kind of lose the edge. That's right. So that's his goal is to return to doing, and he's a young man, so he can do it. Sure. He's very bright. Young man. Okay. And then I also hired um, Dr. Abdel Fattah Noor. Uh, he came here from the Sudan. His wife came as a graduate student and had several children. And he had to leave his job in the Sudan to come and help take care of the children. And I already had a lot of respect for him just for doing that. But he and I used to talk, and he would talk about bi-directional road of international development that, that had to have an exchange in both directions. So I managed to uh, create a position for him, a part-time position initially. And we set out to create an international program in veterinary medicine. And uh, he did some teaching. And then we, I was able to, with Hugh, create a faculty position and with the assistance of the university, you know, that helped with sure. those hires. Uh, and uh, so I think we created really what I think is one of the preeminent international programs on, on, at Purdue and we have a higher percentage of our students going off to international experiences than any other school at Purdue University. Dr. Neuer is stepping down from that job this year. Is he just going to go back to? He's going to go back to professor and teaching. Okay. And he does an awful lot of teaching in physiology and distance courses that he teaches. So mm -hmm. it'll be a busy time. But I think that international stuff is so much in his blood that he will keep doing something international. No, leave completely. He just can't. Help. Right, yeah. But Dr. Neuer was responsible actually for some of my international travels, uh, getting all over Africa and the Middle East, and several, uh, been very broadening experience for me, mm -hmm. working with him. Well, that's, that worked out now. his wife nice. is a wonderful person too. What did she do her graduate work in? Is she still with the uh, university? She did it in microbiology, but now she's doing cancer research, and she is an associate professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Neuer is a professor. He went from assistant associate to professor, you know, so he's done quite well. Good. Yeah, been very successful. Okay. And now his son's working for me, doing those, uh, making those 3D stereo things. <laughs> That's all right. Were you ever a faculty fellow? Before? No. Yeah. That program has changed. It's been long, uh, long, long time. But it's changed a lot. I think I've been in Tarkington for a long time, and uh, it's a good program. I yeah. like it. Yeah. But I think with the what's happened is that with the eating facility sort of centralized and not being in the dorms, that sometimes it's more difficult to. Yeah. It was easier when the students were in the same building. Yeah. They did a lot easier. But yeah. We still I've thought about it from time to time, but I had enough other interests. I've served on the Bach Corral board. Uh, was president of Bach Corral Singers for a number of years. Okay. Did the first out of town trips while I was president. And, uh, and you keep served on the symphony you. board and a member of Rotary. We'll be taking a group of African uh, to Chicago next week. Okay. Yeah. Group study exchange here from Rotary every year, and I take them up to Chicago to Rotary International Headquarters in Evanston. Good. How about uh, for any awards or honors that you care to share with the researchers? Well, I got uh, recognition from Kansas State several years back okay. and uh, got one from Gamma Sigma Delta uh, for, I can't remember the exact title, but something. And then the School of Veterinary Medicine gave me a distinguished award. That's so good. Gotten some. And you're still active in the professional associations with the, the Indiana, the Veterinary Medical Association? I'm still active in the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association, but not that active. Dr. Bill is the paragon of activity where he's president, so compared oh, okay. to that, I'm nothing. <laughs> 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 uh, I helped, uh, I did a lot with uh, Convince and with uh, the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. Early on, had, um, had um, a faculty equivalent to the deans, so it wasn't just the deans getting together, and I was president of that group, or chairman, whatever we called it. I was a founding member of the American Academy of Veterinary Pharmacology and Therapeutics, and served as president of that for several years, and secretary treasurer did all the, the jobs you go through while you're doing those things. Uh, having been so active in that organization since, 
I became associate dean or assistant dean at the School of Medicine. Can't do everything. That's right. It's Can't called time management. It's or called time management. Like that. It's called survival. Whatever it is. But <laughs> a little of both. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's called survival. Uh, yeah. uh, I usually ask people if you have a Purdue tradition. Does something come to mind? What do I like about? Uh, well, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Oh, I think it has to be the graduation ceremony. Others have voiced the same thing. There is. Um, I like the football and I basketball. I'm an avid basketball fan, and I, I joined the John Purdue Club for track and all those things. Which I'm now, but I'm stepping down from the head. I'm going to go back and start golf again. But anyway, uh, there is no graduation anywhere that's the equivalent to the Purdue graduation ceremony. Kansas State had a real one. I walked across the stage at Kansas State and we got real, but it was a much smaller university. But I've gone to Wisconsin, and it's a herd stands up. And I've gone to IU to my daughter's graduation. And I the herd to, stands up. I went to and, the uh, It's uh, there's just nothing like a Purdue graduation. But there are a lot of great, great things. I, I bleed black and gold. Good. How about <laughs> an outstanding event? In your life? Outstanding event. Mm -hmm. in, in my life or at Purdue. In your life or at Purdue, either way. Oh, it has to be. Getting married to Harriet you Katie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now it's your she's, turn. She's uh, yeah. she's the joy of my life. That's great. I've been married for forty. At seventh well, grade. Well, sixty-two yeah. since nineteen sixty-two. Wow. How long is that? That's pretty good. The seventh yeah. grade. That's great. I can't even remember being in seventh grade. <laughs> First time I ever saw her, I was taking a trumpet lesson from her father, and she came bouncing in with one of those skirts that went straight out to the side. You know how they did. Yeah, yeah. And she yeah. wanted money. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's, now it's we'll, we'll let you woman. make some uh, closing comments and looking overall or whatever you'd like to say. I would just say that Purdue's the best thing that ever happened to me because when I came here, one of the things that I wanted was to be involved in teaching, and Purdue rewarded me for that in addition to the scholarship I did. But they counted the, the teaching as an important thing. This is a great community to live in. I sell it to all of the people that I tried to recruit as if you want to help create the culture, this is the ideal place. If you want to go to where it's all preformed and professionals do it every day for you, go somewhere else. But Purdue and Lafayette community are great places to live. Uh, we belong to a great church, First Baptist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very open church, very accepting of diversity, and gender as well as, as racial. It's a good church. This is a great place to live. Being 60 minutes from Indianapolis okay. is not bad. And not too Being far two hours now. from Chicago okay. is not bad. Um, in fact, it's wonderful. It's a great place. Right. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Coppock. Really yeah. enjoyed the interview, and I appreciate yeah. that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay.